size and strength absolutely 100% do matter. They do matter. And anybody who tells, you know, especially someone who tells a 120 or 130 pound woman that, you know, if she just learned some techniques that she could, she could take down a 225 pound strong young man, uh, is, is lying to them, you know, or he's being, he's being dishonest with himself. So this is a, this is actually an event, um, with, um, Jordan's Shield Wall Society. Um, I'm part of Blackwing Collective. It, it's a group that I started, but I, I'm definitely, st I'm part of Jordan's group. Um, and a lot of the, this effort is, is based on our um, mutual interest in like self-defense and, um, you know, women's protection and stuff like that. So um, actually I wanted to ask Jordan um, how she came across this book and like why you chose it for the book of the month. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, let's, I'm going to give a little bit of a background for any viewers that don't really know who I am. And then, you know, you can do the same. You touched on the Black Wing Collective and, you know, Vard as well. Um, but one thing I have, you know, on my website and that I am clear about is I'm actually a survivor of domestic violence and abuse. So I know that is kind of a, a different, you know, category, kind of how you talked about Vard in your book you know, different facets versus, you know, criminal violence and whatnot. But that is what initially got me really interested in self-defense and mindset, personal development, but also learning to fight back, not just physically, but mentally as well. Uh, it's a really, really big thing when someone is close to you that you love, that you're supposed to trust, that hurts you. It's not as easy as fighting back when you know, you're supposed to love this person and whatnot. So that's a whole different mental hurdle. Uh, but as far as um, how I found this book, I actually, someone had posted it on their Instagram story and I don't remember who it was, otherwise I would give them that due credit. But I saw it and I was like, wow, this is really fascinating because I was actually finishing up the book On Killing by Dave Grossman. And so that one is a really, um, I mean, it's an amazing book and it goes into kind of the psychology of killing when it comes to law enforcement and active duty military. So when I saw Varg's book and how it touched more on like civilians and training, I just found it very interesting because that is, you know, it does go so much more beyond the physical when it comes to defending yourself or standing up for yourself is uh, your, your mind and your, Alice, do you, I mean, yeah. Did I answer your question sufficiently? I did. Yeah. Um, I thought that this book was really amazing. So part of my um, journey with, with Black Wing Collective is it's, it's a new group and I've only been um, training in martial arts for, for five years. Um, and in trying to come up with how, how I would leave it, I mean, so there's this long conversation that I'm not going to get into about, about why I started it and, and, you know, how it came to be. But um, in trying to come up with a curriculum, one of the things that was really important to me was um, basically not bullshitting training. And so everything, all of the content in this book was just very top of mind in terms of like answering a lot of questions I have about like, how do I really know that this, that this would actually work? And, and isn't most of it um, like psychological training and, and adaptation. Um, so one of the things that I was thinking about was like when I approach um, fighting and and sort of as a super tiny background, um, I, I grew up with boys. So like we were rough housing all the time and there were just things that I naturally um, picked up through horseplay of, you know, like these are the, these are the targets and, and it doesn't matter like whether you're on the ground, you have a weapon or whatever, well, like weapon as a kids, um, these were the same principles that just applied universally. And so I kind of had that, um, ingrained in me when I started training. Um, and, and I found as a very, very new instructor that that actually isn't instinctive for people. Um, so I was trying to figure out, well, how exactly is fighting taught and especially um, fighting in a in a way that would give people confidence to to defend themselves if they had to. So um, I really loved the content in this book because it it answered a lot of questions that I had. Yeah. 
so the the whole thing about you know approaching violence and 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 wondering if things are going to actually work and things like that um you know like i talk about in my book i came from the world of violence first and then entered the world of professional training so it was very backwards it was most people come from you know if they enter the world of professional training especially tactical or weapons based training gunfighting in the united states it's typically through a law enforcement or military avenue which means that you had a pretty decent background in order to keep you out of trouble to be able to get into those fields because they don't allow criminals in those fields so most people go into the training world without having like real violence experience beforehand and then go into the training world so you're taught in the bubble and it's hard you know the the law enforcement and military fields offer experienced people who can come back and teach so there is some validity in a lot of the areas but not all of them like a lot of the places where they train cadets for law enforcement are are unfortunately taught by people who are you know seeking um positions for you know administrative reasons or political reasons rather than they're actually good at teaching the thing that they're teaching and they have any experience so there's a lot of people you know i just heard an example recently of you know law enforcement cadets being taught at a training facility that um they they need to spread their shots around on the target and you know cause more damage and just ridiculous things like that which which goes in the opposite direction from shot accountability and actually you know controlling yourself controlling your weapon and, and understanding what you're doing at all at all times um so you have some instances of that but in the martial arts world it's much more rampant because there's less there's less experienced um people in the field coming back in to teach it so you have um in law enforcement and military you have people that actually go get in fights and get into gunfights with criminals or get into you know firefights in war zones and they come back and they have all of that and their orientation to pass on to someone else in the martial arts world anybody with you know a black belt or whatever credential they choose to have can open a studio and teach people self-defense so there's a two different you know there's two different worlds going on there and so the only way to really know if something is going to work is to get put under pressure real pressure non-compliant attacker type of pressure and and actually start to build that orientation of like you know being under force pressure and understanding what's coming at you and beginning to be able to reliably predict an opponent's movements and things like that that only happens uh with experience under pressure you know so if you're not testing it with, you, with real validity with real you know consequence then there's there's very little way to know actually if it is going to work yeah um i could i ask you a little bit about i i think I, if I hopefully I remember this correctly, but in in your book you mentioned that you had um, an uncle who is in MMA. Is was that like? Did he have training? Did did you grow up around people who who yes. had been trained? Yes, he was. My that particular uncle was. Uh, this was before MMA was around. So okay, he was in the he was in the Marines in the seventies, and uh, he was exposed there to. Um, martial arts and then from there he took it really seriously uh and and he was very very devout in his training like he did a lot of um uh you know a lot of tantric breathing a lot of yoga yoga um very very high level yoga poses like a scorpion where you know he's basically the only thing touching the floor is from his elbows to his hands and the rest of him is like wrapped around and his his whole upper body is holding his body up and he would stay in that pose for like five minutes which is a uh, it's just a tremendous feat for anybody i i've only known one person that could hold that pose for that long and it was him um you know so i would grow up watching him every day uh do his you know his training and so i had it put in my head very early that that was you know um a viable way 
to have you know a serious amount of physical capability and fighting capability because he was incredibly tough now he was also a criminal and you know he went awalled from the marines got put in prison got out from there um caught the drug charges later got put in state prison so he went to prison a couple times and you know he he'd been in a lot of fights and he was a he was a well-known street fighter in the area so um you know it, it, and it was very very uh common for him to get into a fight and clear out like four or five six guys and so he was extremely well known and you know training level was very high for him thank you so much for sharing varg sorry for um we had another member join so everybody is going to be on mute while they are in the call and um yeah if you want to continue varg sorry for the interruption but thank you for sharing that yeah, no, so that, that I would say that was my beginning, um, my first exposure to like training. Um, but, you know, fight training was kind of uh, always a thing because, you know, when you grow up in the, like the areas that I did, um, especially, you know, in the 70s, 80s, boxing was really big. And Youngstown was, you know, we had Boom Boom Mancini and, and probably half a dozen uh, world champs that came from that area just through the 60s and 70s. So it was a very, very, thick area for, you know, fighting in general. Um, and so there were boxing gyms and, you know, everybody was doing a little bit of something, you know, so it, it was not like, it wasn't like there was a, a bubble that, you know, you're just in the criminal world and there's no training. Like people, there were some pretty tough guys that, you know, put in a lot of work to, to be tough like that. Yeah. Oh man. Jordan, we lost you again. <laughs> Could you yeah, repeat that? Have... Sorry about that. No, I, I heard everything that you guys said. I just think, um, yeah, like I said, it's that, that internet up in the mountains, the connectivity. But um, no, I, I heard what you said, and that's really fascinating how there were a lot of people that took that training seriously and that fighting seriously in the you know criminal world as well. So, um, so you mentioned wanting to talk about the, the importance of physical conditioning, Jordan. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And I mean, that's one thing I see. So I, I work full time at a gun club and I teach the Colorado um, permit course, you know, the Colorado handgun permit course. And, you know, I'm a firearms instructor and I I see a lot of that as well in in that world. A lot of the machismo coming in to the gun club thinking that shooting at a paper target for, you know, an hour, a couple of times a week is plenty sufficient to defend themselves. And a lot of people that do not prioritize, you know, physical conditioning that think, you know, oh, well, I have a gun. So why, why should I do this? Right. And it is a false sense of security because they're <laughs> operating under stress and just because you have a firearm doesn't mean you're going to have distance from somebody either. So I think that, you know, in your book, Lord, you touch really, really clearly on that, which is great. And I mean, that's what the SWS is all about too, is everything is connected, right? You got, even if you have the skills with a firearm, you still need to prioritize fitness. But even if you have those skills, if you are not mentally ready to for an encounter, or something, then it doesn't matter what skill set you have if you are not mentally there to be able to defend yourself. So, and I, I mean, I didn't really go deeply on the importance of physical conditioning, I guess my answer, but I just, I see that a lot. You know, a lot of people thinking that a gun is their ultimate safety net without thinking about anything else, not mindset, not physical conditioning, not anything. So I think no matter what you do, whether it is martial arts or whether it is gunfighting or anything like that, really taking into account all of those things that, that play a role in it. So something that I, um, I was kind of came to mind as you were talking about that is is I, I frequently have these conversations with people about like um, MMA versus street fighting, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is it, it's a very like you know well worn topic I feel, but um, I, I feel like a lot of like there's this attitude of um, if like if you're going to train for competition, then then you get really strong. But if you're training for street fighting or if you're training to defend yourself, that that shouldn't be a factor because 
um, even the weakest person should be able to defend themselves. Uh, and um, so I, I think I, I had that mentality when I first started doing self-defense. Um, and uh, I think like the, the physical condition kind of came along with like my growing interest in it. Mm -hmm. But I, I kind of wonder like what would, um, like why is it so critically important the, the physical conditioning portion of, okay. of training? No, that makes more sense. Um, I mean, I, th I think it's a combination of things like endurance, right? When we had the uh, fight club every other Saturday with the sparring and everything and those long sparring rounds and pretty much anything went, right? I don't know if you ever went to, to JB's. Yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, but it was like anything went, right? If you're gonna do groundwork, great. If you're gonna do standing work, awesome. If you have your knife, <laughs> you know, like it's just a three to five minute sparring round. And that was one thing, um, you know, I've been a personal trainer and, you know, strength coach and everything for 10 years. And I went into that thinking like, oh yeah, I'm in good shape. You know, I should be able to handle this round. And like two minutes in, you're dying <laughs> because yeah. of endurance requirements. So that physical conditioning to be strong, but then to also be able to last in something like that is really important. Um, but I'm sure Barb can touch more on this too, because another thing I noticed, which I know Tiff can attest to, because I've rolled with her on the mats before, is since I have been in you know strength training and personal training for so long, I would try to overcompensate to where I didn't have you know, the same amount of skills because I'd be, you know, a white belt in jujitsu to where I would just try to muscle through everything with brute force and then would also end up tiring myself out in two seconds because I didn't have the skill. Right. So I don't know, maybe Bart can touch more on that because, you know, skills, important physical conditioning, conditioning is important too, but there's also that those are the walls that I personally hit. Yeah. Well, some of the thing that, uh, I, I just, um, I don't know, stuff comes to mind of like conversations that I've had where people were like, you know, if you just cut the muscle in this way, then that is no longer an issue. Um, right. And, you know, and fights finish in like 30 seconds. Otherwise they, they get taken to the ground and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm curious, like, um, I guess, cause fighting there, there aren't really any rules about like who's going to win. And, and just because you train or just because you condition, um, you're, you're automatically like at this, you know, 90% chance or likelihood of winning or something like that. But I would be interested in hearing, um, I guess, sort of like a expansion on, um, how the physical conditioning plays a role into it. Like, is it, is it also sort of a, a mental, is there also a mental aspect to it in terms of, um, being able to 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 perform under pressure or under stress or something. One of the things that I noticed, for example, and and this is competition. This is not actual street fighting. But um, I remember at one point when I was competing, um, just a sense of like wanting to give up because I was like mentally um, didn't want to fight anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't like a physical thing. I wasn't actually physically tired. Just mentally, I was done. Um, and so I, I tapped out. And and I'm curious, like it. I mean, I, I think about that that fight a lot because I'm sort of like, if that was a real fight and I was fighting for my life, am I would I make that same decision? Like, I, I don't know, you know. Um, so, anyways, curious about like the psychological aspects along with the physical conditioning, or if those are two completely separate things. So, I've got a I've got a couple of ideas about that. Um, uh, first of all, you know what I'll say is that if you we're in a room with a bunch of really experienced people who had been in a lot of fights. You don't typically hear these kinds of conversations happening because those questions are all answered. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so what I mean by that is that, you know, it, the people who say that size and strength don't matter have never fought a significant, significantly larger, stronger opponent. Um, and, and that's just, I, I firmly, firmly believe that. Firmly believe that. I have fought some really, really large guys. Um, and I've been picked up and slammed from wall to wall like a rag doll because somebody was, you know, six foot four and you know, two hundred and eighty pounds. And I was, you know, half of their 
half of their size. So size and strength absolutely 100% do matter. They do matter. And anybody who tells, you know, especially someone who tells a 120 or 130 pound woman that, you know, if she just learned some techniques that she could, she could take down a 225 pound strong young man, uh, is, is lying to them, you know, or he's being, he's being dishonest with himself. And the, the importance of strength and conditioning in a fight situation should not even be questionable because fighting is it, is it, is an example of an extreme physical activity and extreme physical activities will tax the body in extreme ways. I mean, it's just, it's just common sense. So your endurance, your strength, endurance, your cardio endurance, your, um, strength output and the repeatability of your strength output. So this is all typical of how you train. If you train for, you know, static strength and power lifting type of, um, you know, slow twitch, uh, long pool type of stuff. Yeah. And, you know, you're going to be strong, incredibly strong, but your fast twitch is going to be low. Your, your explosiveness is going to be low and your endurance is going to be low. So conversely, if you just train cardio, sure, you could run it, you know, a, a, a 5k or 5k's back to back for 10 days in a row, but it doesn't mean that you have any power or any strength to do anything with, you know, another human body using force against you. Right. So you have to balance these aspects out and have a, a good balance of strength, explosiveness, speed, cardio, endurance, you know, and, and strength endurance, both are, are very important. And that's when you can begin to put power and explosiveness through the movements that you're learning in a martial art or self-defense, right? So if you have, if you have a, a certain set of moves or, or defenses that you learn, they require you, they require you to move your body in certain ways. And what strength and conditioning does for you is it, if it's done properly administered by, you know, if you're led by a good coach who knows how to train a person, especially a new person, the, the kinesthetic awareness and the proprioceptive awareness that you gain from the training teaches you how to be aware of your body, where your body is in space, and also how to know when certain act muscles are activated and when they're not, when they're engaged and when they're not. And also it teaches you how to activate and feel the activation of kinetic chains. So if I want to perform a clean from the floor, it's an explosive movement upward. You know, I'm going to have a first pull, a second pull, third pull. I need to know where my body is in space at all times. And I need to know that my posture is engaged, that my, my posture is locked from the base of my skull to my tailbone in a slight arch stays that way throughout the pool that, you know, I can, I can make contact in the, in initiate this, the second pull with a thrust from the leg drive. Like all of this stuff requires me to know when muscles are firing, when they're not firing, how to hold an isometric contraction through an explosive movement. Um, like locking your posture in is isometric while you're exploding with your legs and hips. So understanding how those things happen, then if I lock up with a guy on the street and he's, you know, 200 pounds, I have a, I have a stronger, more well-trained kinetic chain that's going to fire appropriately when I seatbelt him and, and push him up into the air using my leg drive and my hip drive while I'm locking my posture in an isometric contraction. So these are things that you're training yourself to do that you can use directly in fighting, but you're also building your body to be not only strong and explosive in those movements, but, but aware of which muscles are firing completely building the, the neural network to fire more fibers during that movement. Um, you know, all of this happens. The other thing that conditioning will do, like when we're talking about cardio or um, especially cardio, if you're doing more than 30 minutes, you know, you're actually increasing the, the blood capillary network into the muscle fibers. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the blood capillaries actually, your body grows new and longer 
capillaries to feed the muscle as the muscles are adapting and becoming larger and more fibers are growing. And what that does is that makes a more efficient muscle because the muscle is more uh, completely f fed and repeatedly fed, you know, nutrient and oxygen rich blood. So while you're fighting or while you're in a, in a, a situation, it increases endurance and it, and it decreases recovery time because the muscle is more completely fed. So those are just a couple of examples because, you know, one of the things that I do is also I coach strength and conditioning too. So, um, and those are the examples that I use the most when I'm talking about how does this apply in fighting? It's, you know, it's all of those things. And if you don't have those, if you just rely on technique, it will take you, you know, 15 to 20 years of 20 hours a week to get good enough to take on a person twice your size reliably you know, with, with just using technique. Um, and then if, if a technique fails and you get caught, you know, where you have to fight your way out of something, then you have no strength and no explosiveness and no endurance. So it's, it's <laughs> over, right? Yeah. It's very simple. It's a very simple thing I think to understand. Um, it's just that, like I said, when you have a room full of people that have not been in a lot of real fights, these are the types of conversations they have. Because they <laughs> answered. Mm -hmm. No, that's so well put. So well put. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. So, Alice, did you have um, more questions or? I did to... because I mean these these are not from our notes, but I'm curious about um, uh, the way that you train, Vard, because. Um, I, I was trying to figure out, the, I, I don't remember if it was like from Instagram or from your book, um, about like combat fitness. Like what is that? Is that um, training the muscles that are required for certain movements? Or is that like, um, can you, could you just like explain that? <laughs> yeah. So when I had my, my first gym open in uh, 2015 in, in Warren, Ohio, it was, it was called combat fitness. And um, basically what that, what the idea behind that is, is it's primarily fitness training. So it's not skill training. You wouldn't come to my gym to learn how to prepare for a professional boxing match, right? Or for a jujitsu match or something like that. I did have some coaches come in. Um, I'm I'm very very partial to uh, Greco and freestyle wrestling above jujitsu. It's just my preference. Um, I, I guess because I'm old school, I don't know. But the I just like the the you know I like a lot of slams and stuff like that, and I just think it ends a fight quickly. <laughs> um, but so I had coaches come in to do some of that stuff. I had some boxing coaches come in, but primarily. Uh, what I would do is get people on movements that were um, building that, not only building the the body in terms of strength, speed, and explosiveness, and, and endurance, but building the neural network and myelinating those pathways to create movement and footwork and ingrain that in them during their workouts. So a typical workout in that gym would be you would come in, and do um you could do the whole two hours if you wanted to and most people a lot of people would end up doing it but it's the whole session is three minutes on one minute off three minutes on one minute off and you go for a, an hour or two straight like that and it's uh set up off of uh boxing rounds right so three minutes on one minute off it's like a professional boxing round time and you would go in and do i'd say do 10 rounds of the heavy bag and then 10 rounds of uh, the double-ended bag and then do uh, take a break from that and do, um, you know, some explosive lifting and some rubber band, uh, some band work, and then go back and do, you know, uh, five rounds of speed bag and then do, you know, five rounds shadow box in a ring. And the whole time we're, we're emphasizing footwork and emphasizing movement, emphasizing the, just uh, build the proprioceptive and kinesthetic part of the, the body mind complex, right? 
understanding where the body's at, how to move it, the best ways to move it. Because, you know, something I noticed training people on the range is that people who had sports or, or higher end martial arts backgrounds did way better on the range in terms of being able to change levels, change positions, footwork, things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. And people who had no athletic backgrounds did, you know, they, they didn't understand how to move their bodies. They, you put a gun in their hand and they forget how to walk. Yep. It's very, very true. Like it's, it sounds funny, but it literally is how it happens. I so, every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If you see people on a range, like you put a gun in their hand, they, they forget how to walk. They forget how to. <laughs> they forget how to do person. It is wild. Yeah. Yeah. And so people with athletic backgrounds or sports backgrounds would do, would adapt really well because they understand where to place their body and how to move and how to know where they're at and how to shift their leverage, shift their force, you know. And so I wanted to develop that first in people because I think that's a foundation that 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 a lot of people miss, um, especially today where, you know, we're, we live in a CrossFit dominated world now and, it, and they skip five steps of foundation and throw people right into the end of the pool. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it drives me absolutely nuts. And I say that having, having coached in a CrossFit gym. So I'm not just, uh, you know, I, I got inside for a while and, you know, so that I could say what I say confidently, but they, they throw people, you know, five steps past where they should begin. Um, and you have people that don't have proprioceptive or kinesthetic, uh, development that are trying to do complex movements and involve loading and force. And it's a problem. And it's a posture problem. It's a it's a form problem. It becomes a skeletal problem, you know. And, and it, but it, it develops neural pathways that are incorrect, incorrect movement pathways, um, without correcting posture, without correcting movement pathways, and then loading the body. It, it, that just creates trouble. You're compounding problems. So I like to take people before loading them, just get them moving and learn how to move, learn how to understand where their bodies are and things like that. And it's a lot of bag work, a lot of footwork. And, and this is what I would notice. I, I'll take an example. I had a, a 54 year old attorney come in. Um, he was in terrible shape, terrible shape. You know, I had the big <laughs> belly just with, you know, he did two rounds on the bag and he's just like, ah, oh, I'm dying. I'm dying. You know, and he just couldn't, couldn't take it. He, he threw up several times, you know, like, and, um, and, and he pushed through it and, within about three months he would it'd be like an hour and a half and i'd say hey uh i'd say hey dennis you did um you know you've done like uh 30 rounds He'd be like what you know and he didn't realize he did 30 rounds straight you know like uh and that's and that's the the cardio and the the endurance part of it comes with the the training the foundation stuff so so his footwork was good his movement was good his punching and striking was good and strong and solid, but his his cardio and endurance and his output had increased so much during that time. So if you can accomplish foundational things like that, and then what I would do is take, I had people who had gotten to that point or were at that point, then I would take them and start loading them heavier with explosive lifting and periodization and using things to attack whatever weakness they had. Then we would go after the weakness and, and build it up to a strength or bring the body into balance. Um, but at first you got to build that foundation and it's largely, uh, like I say, kinesthetic, proprioceptive and psychological, right? We got to get that all together first. Then you can start loading the chassis and putting more complex tasks on you. That's how I view training. 100%, whether it's the fighting world or the fitness world, just like you said, it's, and I've seen that with the CrossFit gyms and everything too, of someone comes in that no, has no idea of where their body is in space and then give them a loaded barbell. Tell them to yeah. 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 The most complex move in sports. Yeah. Period. And I wonder why the injury rate is so high. Hmm. <laughs> well, so this is another thing that I, I have a question about because um, like I, I just got my, my yoga teacher certification last year and um, one of the things, well, so the the yoga style in, instruction that I I was learning from 
it was very, very strict in terms of like where you put your arms and the distancing and, you know, like the, the posture. And I think that um, going through that training kind of ingrained in me, like this kind of nitpicky sort of like viewpoint. Um, and so when I noticed uh, in your book, something about like you, you allow people to have their own natural movement and, and you correct things that are like going to cause injury, but you don't really um, make more corrections than that, at least in the beginning. Am I like understanding that correctly? Yes. Um, and it's, it's a couple different worlds in slightly different approaches. So I'm uh, like, if we talk about barbell, you know, I, my barbell background goes back 25 years. So I'm super not flexible <laughs> about how barbell is handled. Like I, I'm very like, maybe like your yoga teachers on that, like this, no, you gotta do, but there's, um, you have to take into consideration certain things. Like if I was to have a lifter who is, you know, six foot four and super lanky with really long, um, femurs and, you know, really long, just limbs and just every, his proportions are just very long, you know, and he's not going to be able to do the technique that the five foot two lifter is doing. The hand placement's going to be different. The, the, the elbow flexion is going to be different. Like everything is going to be different for that person. Same thing with, um, you know, I was teaching, a a kid how to shoot one time he was going into the Navy, he wanted to learn how to shoot you know, to prepare kind of, and, um, he was six, he had to be six foot six. I, I, he was definitely like Abdul Kareem Jabbar level, right? Like his hands were like huge, man, like unbelievably, like his fingers were like rulers, you know, 12, <laughs> like, and, you know, so teaching him to shoot a Glock 19, there is no physical way he could put his pad on the trigger it was just not possible he had to put that he had three inches of finger sticking out of the other <laughs> side you know, and so but that's his hand you can't change that you so now we have to use you know um just proper trigger press wherever your hand is wherever your finger's at like so there's different you know um uh different proportions, different types of movement. I don't want to take someone and try to rewire them or put them into um, leverages and angles that their body's not built for. So that just doesn't make sense. So you, you know, and all and bodies are completely different. You have somebody that's six, three, somebody that's five, two, somebody that's very compact and powerful, somebody that's, you know, stretched out and strong, but not as powerful, right? Not as quick with their power. Um, and so you have to compensate for those and the body naturally compensates. You just have to guide it along and make sure that, you know, for example, the universal thing with all of them is lock your posture in, you know, I don't care how long your body is, your posture needs to be locked. Right. So that's a universal, um, and, and for, you know, in terms of doing explosive, explosive movement pull, right. Um, and so there are certain things that you correct for everybody, but there's things that you find that they have to do a little bit differently and that's okay, right? You have to understand that that person needs to, to do that as long as they can accomplish the move, not violate the universal principles like lock posture and, you know, proper uh, shoulder over bar and all that kind of stuff. If they're not violating those principles, then you allow them to have their own movement pathways that are efficient for them. And the same thing with fighting, the same thing with, um, uh, you know, training weapons, like all of that stuff is going to be, you know, people need to develop their own pathways and you can't allow them to like conditioning builds technique. And there's nothing anyone will say that will convince me otherwise, because that's what you see. If you go into a boxing gym, you know, they'll put you on a bag and then not pay attention to you and say, work, 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 work. <laughs> And they'll just correct a thing here, a thing there, a thing here. And once you prove to the coaches you're going to show up for four or five months and work your butt off, right, then then you're worth their time. But you've already developed this ability to 
to move well and and think on your feet and be able to you know understand where your body's at change positions change angles so you got that stuff down now you can actually understand what they're going to say to you but it's not like coming in and like you know telling you exactly where to place your elbow and exactly how to twist your wrist here and you know you let the you let the fighter develop how their body and how their mind is kind of tended towards developing but guide them so that they so that they adhere to universal principles that that need to be adhered to right like in weapons you know you got the safety aspects and things like that and in barbell you have safety and posture and you know a certain positioning and things like that so as long as they're doing those things and, and they're they're not violating safety or violating um you know positioning then the slight variations of of movements are okay because that's how that person's going to get to that more efficiently and more quickly does that make sense yeah absolutely